session, you know, we're going to be uh, myself, John, James, and Jared uh, will be we're talking about our experience on Wall Street. Both has guides and also has professional wor working on Wall Street. Let me just start off with a background about myself, and then I'll have uh, uh, John and Jared and James kind of jump in and share their background. And so just briefly, you know, I worked in Wall Street um, before the financial crisis leading up to it as a vice president in Deutsche Bank trading CDOs, collateral as debt obligation. And so I was very uh, close to what was happening. And so Deutsche Bank, uh, my boss, was actually portrayed in The Big Short, the movie The Big Short. And um, Ryan Gosling played my boss in that movie. And so I started the tour in 2009, just uh, sharing kind of what we saw during the financial crisis um, and, and telling people about what it's like working on Wall Street, uh, the events of the, of the financial crisis, and, and also where to take the best pictures and also bring in the history of the area because it's such a historic area. Uh, so that's a bit about me, um, John, yourself. Okay, um, I, I am a, a history buff, as a matter of fact. So, uh, getting the opportunity to do these tours was uh, was quite a quite a uh, a revelation and a wonderful thing for me. Uh, I spent my entire career in finance, as a matter of fact, working in commercial banks, uh, Chase Manhattan, Chemical, Marine Midland, when those two places existed. Uh, but uh, uh, eventually, ended up in public finance. Uh, worked for the city of New York, ended up as a deputy controller for public finance, and public finance was in charge of issuing bonds, municipal bonds, the bonds that the city's issues to, to, to fund roads, schools, the whole nine yards. Uh, then switched over to the dark side, went to work for an investment bank, right, that wanted to do more business with the city. Uh, so did that for 10 years and um, eventually left that uh, because <laughs> ironically, one of the things I discovered was uh, that I was more interested in the history and the stories than I was in actually doing finance, despite having spent an entire career in it. And so that's my background. Great. Uh, James or Jared, you guys want to jump in? Yes, this is uh, Jared. Uh, I uh, got my start on Wall Street in 1987. I work for a company called E.F. Hutton. And anybody over 50 remembers their very famous television commercial slogan, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. And um, uh, it probably was uh, closest, if you've heard of Merrill Lynch, it was sort of a little smaller version of Merrill Lynch. <clears throat> Merrill Lynch. And I was a little sad to see that Bank of America, which uh, purchased Merrill Lynch after uh, the financial crisis uh, 10 years ago has just decided to phase out the Merrill Lynch name. So now that era of E.F. Hutton and Merrill Lynch will forever uh, no longer have those names. But I was licensed three months before the crash and uh, the market fell 508 points that day, about 22 percent of the market value. But the big question then was whether the Dow was going to hit 4000. So when you have a 508 point drop when the Dow is nearing 4,000, that's a larger percentage drop than a 508 point drop today. But needless to say, uh, my, my timing was terrible. Uh, and so I decided not to continue as a retail broker with EF Hutton. After a few years in sales, went on to law school and uh, ultimately got a little bit of experience in uh, white collar uh, criminal defense cases. So having my uh, background on Wall Street uh, came in useful there. But after being in uh, business for myself uh, for 10 years, uh, coming back to New York from various uh, other uh, states, um, I got back into guiding. And, and just like John White said, I found that the stories uh, were actually more interesting uh, on Wall Street in particular. Uh, in New York, uh, generally, and Wall Street specifically, uh, they were more interested than actually doing the work. So I'm uh, very much uh, uh, smiling when John White gave his introduction. Thanks, Jared. So uh, I don't hear from James. So I, I think he has connection issues. Uh, so uh, so I guess we'll just continue. And uh, James, uh, 
Fortunately, we'll have to join us another time. So uh, last last week I, we shared about uh, you know our, our favorite movies. Uh, mine is obviously kind of the big short because it's so close to home and to what we did. And uh, and Jared said, uh, Jared, what'd you say? Was it uh, a Wolf of Wall Street? Right? Yeah, in the eighties, because because you uh, you saw things in the eighties and you thought that was very accurate. Well, and, actually, Andrew, um, it was a crash of eighty seven. If I said eighty nine, I apologize. But the, the movie back then, which pushed my generation into finance and Wall Street, was not the it was not the wolf. It was the original Wall Street with Michael Douglas and that famous uh, scene where he talks in the shareholder meeting of Teldar paper that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Right. It cuts through. It purifies. Um, and that's really what pushed us into Wall Street. Right, those those uh, greed and fear, right? Those uh, strong emotions that cause people to act. Fundamental, <laughs> right? Fundamental emotions, right? What about you, John? You have a favorite Wall Street movie? You know, I, I will say um, I, I liked uh, Wall Street. Uh, I liked The Wolf of Wall Street, but I was I was really uh, pretty impressed with um, The Big Short just because they took a, a, a pretty difficult subject matter and made it digestible to, to anybody. I mean, whether you had a background in Wall Street or not, I mean, obviously having lived in that world and, and, and all that, a lot of it was, uh, even though I wasn't involved directly in the same kind of stuff, obviously you were. Andrew, uh, it, it, it was understandable, comprehensible, but I mean, I think they did just an excellent job in, in, in making that material accessible to people and I really appreciate, appreciated it as, as a vehicle for doing that. Yeah, especially like when they had, uh, I guess, that, that girl in the hot tub <laughs> explaining what the CDO is. I thought that was like fantastic. It was great. It was great. Yeah, it was all great. About, exactly. Yeah, that's right, Linda. <laughs> very, very good job. Oh, yeah. man. So, uh, you know, so uh, when I started guiding on Wall Street, just telling people about uh, what's going on in a financial crisis, that was really before people understood what were the cause, right? So before the, all the documentaries came out, before the books came out, I was out there just talking to people, telling them about what, was, what, was, what I saw as the cause of financial crisis. Uh, but before I start my tour, sometimes people ask me these things like, Andrew, do you feel guilty for causing the financial crisis? And, uh, that was like, wow, that was like, I, I remember the first time I heard that. And it wasn't the only time. And uh, I mean, I have my two, had two reactions. One is like, wow, I feel, I, I, I feel like, uh, I feel pretty powerful if people think that I personally could have caused financial crisis. And two, the second thing is, is you know, I tell them, okay, let's listen to my tour and, and then you'll see kind of what I think is all the, all the factors that led to the financial crisis, right? So for you to believe that I caused it or me and my buddies caused it, I think it's, uh, I think it's giving us more credit than, than, uh, than we're due. Um, and also I saw that, uh, um, you know, I felt that people that understood the financial markets, uh, they were the ones that really got a lot out of the, uh, out the tour, out of the tour. The most difficult people for me to give the tour were, were I guess young students, right? Because uh, they just had we had to kind of create the context for them to understand the financial markets, kind of what it is that they're saying. Uh, but that's but that's exciting too. So you know we would equate the stock market to supermarket, and then, whereas supermarket all those prices are set in the stock market, the prices are not set by the the merchant is you know, buy and sell it will set the prices. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, some of those funny stories. I don't know if John or, or Jared, if you guys had any uh, any uh, funny stories when you were doing the tours? Oh, it's kind of interesting. Jared and I have talked about this actually. Um, it's, 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 it's sometimes um, uh, you have to end up adjusting how you're going to talk about anything because of what what you mentioned exactly what you mentioned um younger people tend to have uh, no context uh, to put any of this stuff in no ex no experience uh, they didn't they didn't go through it they didn't see it they didn't live it they didn't work in it and so um you know they they haven't experienced it in their work lives in any way shape or form so y you have to sort of deconstruct uh, the edifice of all this 
material that you're ready to talk about, right? Um, in order to pres in order to pres uh, uh, create a, a context that they can understand some of it within, and then sort of reconstruct the material around a simpler construct, uh, so that they can understand what you're talking about. And that that's 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 one of the missions, uh, un untold stories and missions of guiding, being able to uh, kind of make those adjustments on the fly as you discover who your audience really is that day. Right. And you know, like, like uh, I guess having given these tours over and over, what, what happens is you can almost do it in your sleep. And then so mm -hmm. I would go on automatic. So I would just talk, but then my eyes and ears, I'll be watching for the reactions of the, of the audience and I can just on the fly based on that. Um, yeah, so that's uh, exactly, you, you obviously, we obviously want to make sure that, uh, uh, that we present material that's understandable, that connects to people uh, you know, all different levels of, of uh, understanding. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah. So so the hardest thing for me is like with how to make finance exciting. Right. So and and because finance, it's a conceptual thing. And so how to bring it to life. And uh, if you're showing people Statue of Liberty, these famous landmarks, there's something to see. But for these, uh, you know, financial tours, it's kind of you're seeing these buildings. But what's happening is the action that happens, uh, like when people are sitting down in front of the terminals, and then it's it's all mental, right? And then describing what's happening mentally on an abstract conceptual level—that's kind of the hard thing to do. And uh, so you know, we try to do that on our tours with with stories, analogies, and, and things like that. So, so like, you know, we talk about the bailout of the federal government uh, of AIG, right? And then it was, uh, it was a half a trillion dollars, right? So, and uh, so we kind of give a sense of how much money that will, how much of a hundred dollars boat, hundred dollar bills would fill up the streets. If that was, uh, you know, basically we show people who fill up this whole street six feet high, uh, you know, all the way across the street. Kind of give people a visual, and then there's other things we kind of we talk about. We try to make an analogy, uh, yeah, so people can kind of grasp it. All right, we've got some questions, um, Andrew. Before yeah, you right. get questions, can I make a quick addition to that? Mm -hmm. Andrew, um, yeah. well, uh, just to take uh, take further what you're saying about tours and how it, you know John mentioned you have to deconstruct and then build up again. And uh, you're talking about how you're reacting to people and using analogies like how much a uh, hundred dollar bills, you know, how much is a hundred trillion, how much is a half a trillion dollars in a hundred million dollar bills or a hundred dollar bills. In the same sense, um, I find that, you know, it's best to start big and then get smaller. Like I always emphasize that this was a systemic failure. There was so much blame to go around. And yes, the banks on Wall Street deserve a huge amount of blame. It was rife with um, conflicts of interest, all sorts of problems. Um, and so, yes, they deserve a, a lot of the blame. Uh, but it's also unfair to make Wall Street the total whipping boy. And if you have an advanced group, if you have a more advanced group that you're leading, you can go in different areas with it. That's what makes it so exciting. I'm trying to take off in what Andrew's talking about, what makes finance exciting. Because I'll say, you know, there's all this literature, there's all these movies, there's all these books that condemn what happened on Wall Street, and rightly so. But what about, you know, newer theories, such as what caused the financial crisis uh, was in part due to American consumer spending. In other words, you know, treating their homes as cash machines to take home lines of credit, credit and second mortgages to fund a lifestyle they couldn't afford, right? You know, in other words, if you look closely, the average debt of an American household doubled in real dollars adjusted for inflation in the 20 years leading up to the financial crisis 10 years ago. Or one other way I give a, a visual is to say, what was the magnitude of the of the uh, failure of Lehman Brothers, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. And I'll ask my group, again, if they're a little more sophisticated, you know, what was the largest American bankruptcy before Lehman Brothers? And people, you know, some people might say Enron, they'd be right. 
and I say, let's do a visual. How much larger a uh, bankruptcy was Lehman Brothers than was Enron? And I, I use this to describe a concept known as too big to fail. Well, I start very small and I say, you know, I'm a foot off the ground with my hand and I, uh, you know, below my knees and I say, uh, this was the failure of Enron. And then I raise my hand above my head as far as my arm will reach and say six and a half or 6.39 times larger. This was the failure of Lehman Brothers. So the next large, you know, the previous, uh, the Le fail failure of Lehman Brothers was 639% larger than the failure of Enron. And giving these concepts and, and to paint a more broad brush, I think makes a, you know, it's fair to Wall Street, but it's also critical on Wall Street. I think we just have to be able to, to illustrate the blame was systemic in nature and to take it away from any one player. Yeah. So uh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So during the financial crisis tour, we kind of show the different participants throughout the chain. And then there are a lot of failures up and down. And uh, to give order magnitude, to kind of give people a sense of the magnitude of different things in the financial history, that's also kind of what we do. And it's, sometimes it's hard for people to kind of get a sense of the magnitude. So we try to bring that home in the tours. Uh, I'm just going through the comments. Marta suggested the movie La Capitale, French. Very good. Um, I'm going to watch it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Netflix yeah, or Amazon Prime. Allison's asking, is, is there a buying and selling goal at Wall Street? Uh, well, so, so, uh, so I guess Wall Street, the, the, you know, we, we all know Wall Street is a physical, physical street where they built a wall. Uh, but I guess Allison's meeting and the financial markets is a buying and selling of gold. So, uh, so I, yeah, I mean, definitely in the financial markets, there is buying and selling of gold. It typically, uh, you know, futures, your a contract, um, your agreement to buy gold, um, a certain amount of gold in the future at a certain amount of, at a certain price. So the gold futures gets gets traded. Um, there's also ETFs tied to gold value that are that are traded. And during the financial crisis, when banks were going under, I remember traders on my desk. They went out during lunchtime and bought stacks of gold. So, so there were apparently places near Wall Street you can actually go to buy physical gold. And uh, so they will have these quarter million dollar stacks on their trading desk because they want to get the money out of the, uh, the banking system uh, because the banks were collapsing. And then you see these guys, of course, million stacks of gold on trading desk. It was, it was surreal. All right, Madison's, Madison's asking, um, why were the statues of the bold and little girl built in Wall Street? So this is—it's a funny story. I don't know if you guys want to tell the story, John or, or Jared. Uh, uh, this funny story behind the bull and the little girl. Anybody want to take this up? You want to say something, Jared? Sure, sure. Um, I, I'll give the—I know I tend to be a bit long-winded, so I'll give the abridged version. Um, the older statue is the charging bull, charging bull, commonly known as a charging bull, created by the Italian artist Arturo de Modica over a two-year period from 1987 to 1989. Now, I mentioned earlier the crash of 87. Uh, he wanted to inspire Wall Street. That's why he constructed, spent two years, the next two years after the crash, uh, and then he wanted to inspire Wall Street using about $360,000 of his own money. He did not receive a, um, a uh, uh, commission, so he had to do that on his own. When it was finished, of course, it was dropped off in front of the stock exchange. At that time, in December 1989, there, were, it was, there was uh, traffic allowed on the street. So needless to say, with no permit uh, the, uh, you know, to be there in the middle of Wall Street, uh, the, uh, like a few people on Wall Street, uh, the charging bull was put in jail. The charging bull was... Uh, confiscated by the city of New York. But fortunately, the Parks Department, uh, Henry Stern, the commissioner, loved the bull, and he brought it out of jail into where its current location there at Bowling Green. Uh, and it's about a 6,000-pound cast bronze uh, statue. 
and of course represents the bull market, which is the rising market uh, on Wall Street. And there certainly is no bear, right? Only, only the bull. By comparison, the Fearless Girl is a newer statue, uh, dates to, I'm sorry, just a few years ago. I think it's only been since uh, March of 2000, was it 17, 18, that it's been in New York. International uh, Women's Day. What's that? International Women's Day, March of 2017. You're right. Of Was it 2007? March of 2017. Yeah. It was commissioned by the State Street Advisors, which was a bank that got in trouble for paying its uh, men and its, lady, its men and women uh, employees differently. And they rehabilitated themselves very well. They, uh, they now have equal pay for everybody, uh, regardless of sex. And they had tremendous success um, uh, giving a commission to Kristen Visbal, who's, I believe, from Uruguay, but she resides in Delaware. And she created the Fearless Girl, which is a very small statue. But in March 2017, as John noted, you know, this is a tipping point time, right? You've got the Me Too generation. Uh, you've had President Trump recently reelected, but uh, noted for some, uh, some rather uh, risque comments regarding female anatomy. Uh, you had this notion of disparity pay. And so uh, it, it really became a focal point, uh, um, a, you know, like um, it, it became such a symbol. So when you go to Wall Street today, and the statue originally, the fearless girl originally was at the uh, same location at Bowling Green where the bull is, but uh, it was too crowded. It was too, pedest too many pedestrians taking photo, created a safety hazard. So they have now appropriately moved her uh, to Wall Street or to Broad Street, right adjacent to Wall Street, looking right at the uh, Broad Street entrance to the New York Stock Exchange. And of course, she represents, if it's not immediately clear, this concept of gender equality. And how do you measure gender equality? Well, very generally, if you're looking at a corporate world, you know, generally how many women, how many men work for any given company, but more particularly, how many of the women are uh, executive officers, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief technical officer, or how many women are, uh, you know, on the board of directors The more, you know, if we're going to have gender equality, it has to be throughout all positions. And so it's become this beloved uh, statue and uh, always a demand for two groups to have their group photo taken there. Uh, just to add something, another reason why the little girl got moved from uh, where the bull is is because it's, stop and think what her purpose is, right? Her purpose is to uh, basically for, uh, be a stand in for the need for more gender equality, both in the world of finance generally, but specifically on Wall Street, right? Um, so when she first came to New York, there she was. And if you've seen pictures of her, right? Arms akimbo, leaning forward, looking like she's confronting something. All right. When she first came to New York, what was she confronting? She was put right in front of the bull. Okay. But remember why the bull came to New York or what it was constructed for in the first place. It was meant to be sort of a symbol of resilience and hope. Uh, in the wake of this horrendous financial crisis at the time, the crash of 87, right? So the guy, Arturo de Modico, who built the bull, was livid when she, the little girl showed up. He didn't have any problems with gender equality and all that, but he did think that the little girl's presence confronting his bull was completely distorting the meaning of his bull, right? So they were back and forth in the paper about it, all that sort of thing. And so there she is, okay, confronting the bull. I mean, he th look at that, right? Her purpose is a good purpose, right? But what he switched, what, what the statue there has done is turn this bull into some representative of some macho version of Wall Street and is not what he intended at all. His intention was to make this a positive symbol of Wall Street, right? So that was one of the reasons that went into why the little girl got moved over to Wall Street uh, back in front of the stock exchange as well. And I mean, you stop and think about it, way more appropriate for her to be confronting an institution like the stock exchange as opposed to this bull. Because if there's anything that's behind, right, gender inequality issues in the world of finance, it would be institutions like the New York Stock Exchange, not the poor little bull. Wow, John, that's, that's really great. <laughs> so, yeah, that's yeah, it's spot on with that. I'm just gonna get grab a photo of a uh, screenshot of where she is now. Uh, let's see, let's see, ah, there she is. So right in front is the as the stock exchange. There she is. So I actually live. I mean, I actually live uh, in the building behind where she's standing, and uh, so every day you see a lot of people taking pictures with uh, with the fearless girl. 
And recently, a few weeks ago, she has a, she had a face mask on. I think it's still on. It's still on her. So uh, that's the state of uh, the fearless golden girl now. Right and on. May I just add, if you look closely at the arms, look how the dark patina finish has been worn off of the arms and exposing more of the uh, the bare bronze. That that means people are holding her, you know, using their hands and rubbing up on the uh, on the arms of the bull. In other words, uh, they, the bull the uh, or of the uh, fearless girl. The fearless girl is endearing to them. Oh yeah. Right. Look at that. Look at that patina. Missing patina. Right. By the way, you'll see missing patina on the bull as well. People rub the bull because it's a symbol of prosperity around the world. So there's lots of shiny parts of the bull as well. Just when you get down there, anybody who hasn't been there yet, you'll you'll notice that. Same kind of logic, though. Yeah, and Linda is just pointing out, where is the bull shiny? <laughs> where is the similar <laughs> thing on the bull that's very shiny where people rub? Yes, really, so it is very endearing. I see so many people just want to take pictures with her, little kids. And I, want, I wonder what it does to little kids when they see this little girl just standing there. It's kind of like it probably gives them like hope, right? And that yeah. like, I could stand up to to things that seems impossible. I can do things that are that are improbable, that seem improbable for me to do. And so I see a lot of little kids kind of take pictures with their parents doing that. But I wonder what's going through the mind of the little kids when they do that. And if they understand what the meaning of it is. And yeah, so, but anyway, back to what Linda's saying. Yeah, so the bull. So, and you guys want to share the story with where the bull has been rubbed? <laughs> I'm not going to. Let's just say there are many different cultural traditions around the world, okay? And uh, people believe that rubbing the bull in various parts of the bull, you know, uh, according to their cultural traditions, uh, brings luck. And so what you'll notice is that various parts of the bull's anatomy um, have that uh, missing patina that uh, Jared was talking about. And I would only add specific. Not I would, just, no. I'm sorry. I would I would only add that um, there. You know, the obvious place where the patina is lost on the bull is just like on the fearless girl. It's going to be on the horns and it's going to be on the face because many people are willing to stand in line for long periods of time to get that front view of the uh, of the bull. But let's just say regarding the second place and there's really only two places where the patina has been lost in extent extensively or almost completely uh it is an anatomically correct bull so hopefully that will uh that will give you off the second one without saying it mm. right huh <laughs> and there and there it is by the way just one other thing about the bull that i wanted to bring out there's sort of an apocryphal uh legend on the street of, of, about why a bull is a a symbol of an upmarket by the way the opposite of a bull as you probably know is a bear right bear is a symbol of a down market right but you will never ever see a statue of a bear in new york all right no, no such thing. Nobody's interested in bears. OK, um, but the reason that the bull is the symbol, according to this apocryphal legend, right, the reason that the bull is the symbol of an upmarket um, uh, is because of the way it attacks. A bull and a bear are both enormous, very dangerous, wild animals. Right. And they attack humans or anything else, it gets in their way. So when a bull attacks you, what it does is it charges and gets you on its horns and throws you in the air, okay? Um, that's why it's the symbol of an upmarket. Okay? And a bear, when it attacks you, has anybody seen the revenant? Oh, yeah. great, great reference point for why the bear is a symbol of a down market. When a bear attacks you, it jumps on you and crushes you to the ground, all right? And you lose consciousness right away, okay? So anyway, that's why the bear is a symbol of a down market. So that's, oh, that's, violence. I know, well, hey, oh, here's the thing though, but you know what? According to this legend, of course, that's the whole point. Because here's the thing, the symbols, of markets up and down. Markets only go up or down, and they can stay stable for a while, but eventually they go up and down. And the symbols of both an up and a down market are both enormous, extremely dangerous, wild animals attacking you, right? So what's the takeaway from that? I mean, how did that happen? 
Well, for me, the takeaway is, right, that if you're interested in finance, you need to remember that market's going up, market's going down, right? Both savage wild animals attacking you, markets are never your friend. And that's the apocryphal legend of why you got the bull and the bear as the symbols of markets up and down. You better be careful, right? If you're involved in finance or if you got any money in the markets, right? Because you're trotting down the road all happy with yourself with all your money, okay? But on either side, you got something waiting for you. You're either going to get crushed or gored if you step off the path. Yeah, it's just, uh, I, mean, I want to share my personal experience trading. So, so uh, you know, so I was trading for Deutsche Bank, but also I was trading for my personal account. So personal account was trading the S&P 500 and gold, just really broad market indicators. So there's no conflicts. And, uh, and uh, you know, we were we were basically trying to short the market. So you know, we we saw things were coming, um, and then so you know, we shorted the stock market. And so when the day when Lehman went under, that was when my personal portfolio did really really well, and I was really ecstatic when that happened. And it, it kind of like it kind of uh, gave validation to kind of everything we we're doing, shorting the market because. You know, it's not easy to be a short, right? So when you're shorting, the market is going up and up and up. You know, sometimes, you, sometimes like you know, people, people they certainly would doubt you, and you may have, you may doubt yourself as well. So that's why when it when it went down, we were so happy, not because people lost their job with the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, but because it validated our shorts. But then after that, there was a period of wild market swings. I remember I was trading futures in one particular day. I was trading this on my personal portfolio was down $40,000 in a matter of hours. And uh, boy, you know, like it was such a weird feeling because I almost lost control of my bodily function. I had to <laughs> run to the bathroom. I don't know what took over, but it was just fear. It was, it was exactly was a fear I never experienced before. I was like, I just don't know what's happening. I ran to the bathroom. I was like, oh my gosh, and uh, yeah, it was it was just like it was a wild, wild like feeling to to have both up and both up and downs. Anyway, with uh, with a bear, bear and bull, actually, you see a lot of street vendors selling that those uh, those figurines. On, on Broadway. So uh, if you visit Wall Street, you see those figurines for sale. Now you know what it's about, courtesy of what, uh, what John would say and Jared. And so, uh, yeah, so you can see a bear and a bull fighting each other as figurines. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, I know we also have people joining us from Facebook and, and YouTube. And so uh, anybody there, if you guys want to have any comments or questions, anything, anything you guys want to ask us or have us talk about, let us know. Um, so we're monitoring those, those channels as well. Yeah. You know, the, the fear thing, um, Andrew, that, that you'd mentioned, um, I, I, I sometimes wish that I, I listened more to what I say on the tour. All right. Because, uh, and this gets back to the whole notion of, of, of making finance come alive. Uh, one of my favorite stories is, is the one that we use, uh, uh, 40 wall street, the world's tallest building. Right. And the conjunction between the world, the building of the world's tallest building and global financial disasters. Right? I mean, we talk about it as a story. OK. Um, or, or we did until recently. Right? I mean, we, we all know Borders Dubai got constructed and all that. Uh, it got finished at the, in, the, in the housing crisis and everything. The Great Recession. But here we go again. Two world's tallest buildings are in the process of construction right now in Saudi Arabia and Dubai. And what happens? Okay, we we got this madness that's that's happening, and I, I wish that that the fear factor. I mean, that that kind of story helps finance come alive because it, it's it's real. Whatever the reasons are, I mean, the conjunction is absolutely real. But I wish I'd felt more of the fear because I would have sold some things that I got hammered on. Okay, before this before this crash happened uh, a few months ago that we're still trying to get out of. Um, so uh, just two confessions. That's all. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's certainly hard to follow the advice. 
it's certainly easier to give the advice than to follow it. <laughs> that's our story, right? right. So that, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, like, like the big drop off with coronavirus kind of thing. And that, uh, I mean, before that, it was really just going up and up and up. It was it was really just a solid trend upwards, but then, right. you know, then it dropped downwards. You know, the, I guess the most important thing is just don't sell at the bottom, right? So no. as long as you don't sell, it's already kind of making a nice recovery. Uh, yeah, so yeah, definitely. I mean, there are definitely indicators for when credit is loose, people are jubilant, and then people can be making uh, investments that aren't wise. All right, so uh, questions. Uh, Pam is asking, is there a story about a tree has the start of trading? Well, yeah, there there is a tree, uh, a buttonwood tree, and uh, that's actually replanted in front of the New York Stock Exchange because that tree symbolized a much older version of that tree. It was the original tree where traders used to gather and trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, it was before they even had the building. Just think way back when, you know, traders, it was not a glamorous kind of career. It wasn't in a career path. It was just something that people did. And they just need a meeting place to trade. So I suppose they say, hey, let's meet under that tree and we'll trade. <laughs> and so, so it's kind of like a meetup group or something like that. People just get together and they started trading things. And um, I think one thing led to another to start trading bonds and stocks of, uh, of companies and of governments. And I think, I, I, I forget this, but Jared, John, you guys may know of this. I think, I think the oldest bond was uh, U.S. government bond was issued. U.S. government bond was issued during the Revolutionary War, I believe. Right. So uh, corporate bonds obviously go back a lot further than that. So bonds of corporations, trading companies that was set up, obviously went back further than that. So, so yeah. So they were trading this. They were trading this under the, the buttonwood tree, and um, and that tree. Now it's a young tree. It was planted recently. Uh, maybe I would say five, six years ago in front of New York Stock Exchange. And that's what that tree symbolizes. Yeah. I think the original tree was down um, in front of where 60, 68 oh, Wall Street. Right. Down right. by, um, yeah, right, right, right. And, and you know, Andrew, you mentioned um, that it wasn't a glamorous uh, occupation back then, um, sort of, you know, sketchy individuals, you know, Wolf of Wall Street kind of people, right? Um, who 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 were engaged in that business? I mean, I had heard something. I'm not 100 percent sure it's 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 true, but I had heard that actually uh, the tree uh, was out in front of a tavern. Uh, Stock Exchange didn't have an office, so they used to hang out in this bar, right? And so right. um, then they'd run out the door and grab people off the street. They knew had some money. Hey, why don't you buy some bonds? You know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Right. And um, so when they decided to all get together uh, and create the New York Stock Exchange, uh, uh, there was this tree right outside uh, 40 Wall Street, uh, or rather 60, I'm sorry, 60, 60, 68 Wall Street, right outside the bar. And they, they signed their agreement at the table on the bar. So I mean, that, I don't know if that's true or not. But Has the three goes. One other uh, wonderful uh, story about just to take off on what, um, you know, the Buttonwood Agreement and, uh, uh, you know, the issuing of corporate and then government bonds. One of the things we talk a lot about on our Wall Street tours is uh, Alexander Hamilton, who, of course, in the modern world, uh, so many people are aware of him because of the success of the great musical uh, Hamilton uh, composed by Lin-Manuel Miranda, bringing it into the modern setting. But he was the first Treasury Secretary, and as the first Treasury Secretary, he issued an extensive amount of government bonds to pay the debt that was incurred by the individual states uh, in the Revolutionary War. So that was like the first major public uh, government bond issue issued by uh, Alexander Hamilton. And if you know you come on one of the tours, that will be one of the things we talk more about Alexander Hamilton. But just as an aside to the whole Buttonwood Agreement and uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, they have a phrase that history repeats, right? And the Buttonwood Agreement uh, essentially had two basic rules. Um, uh, and what first one was that you'd only trade with other, other brokers. You wouldn't trade with outsiders. And uh, the second rule was you'd charge a minimum commission, one quarter of 1%. Now, arguably, that second rule, charging a minimum commission, would violate what we call today antitrust laws or anti 
uh, laws that were designed to go against monopolies, right? You've heard of the great monopolies like Standard Oil of Ohio, right? And, uh, uh, you know, monopolies and how they're unfair uh, because uh, monopolistic companies can control the market and set the prices. And in that situation, the, uh, the, uh, govern the uh, consumer suffers. And we talk more, we talk on these tours about how you can look at how history is repeated with the companies like uh, Google and Amazon and Alibaba and Apple and Netflix um, and uh, Samsung. We, we can talk about how many ways uh, we have sort of a return to the monopolistic standard but in high technology. So there's so many uh, so many ways you can go starting with the Buttonwood Agreement and going it into the modern world. It's a living, breathing thing, not only the history of finance, but what's going on now. So Pam, there's a tree right there. That's that's the, uh, that's the tree you're talking about. Yeah. And, and wow, look at these gentlemen out there, huh? With, with top hats and everything like that. <laughs> look, look very respectable. Yeah, it does. I, I this this is uh, you know a re envisioning of the folks who were really doing this I think yeah this is, right. is that really a, like an alcohol tavern or is that like a like a, like a club or I a think it's, club? it's a it's a you're right it's some kind of social society social society, exactly yeah look at the gentlemanly things they're doing oh wow I think by the way that Buttonwood is an old name for sycamore. So I think I think I think a buttonwood tree is actually a sycamore tree. So just just another little tree fact there. And that that tree in front of the stock exchange is the scrawniest little thing you'll ever see. <laughs> it doesn't grow. It doesn't get enough right, light, right. vitamin D. It's not. Yeah, it's in a, in a concrete jungle. Yeah, it yep. is a sycamore. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Linda. Say, do you think fiscal money will be a thing of the past? So how long do you think this will take? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is decreasing, right? The money, uh, I guess the need for people to print money, to use money to, for currency, that is decreasing. It is a cost for the U.S. government to kind of have to print it, have to manage it, to clean it, take bad, ripped things out of circulation. Um, and I guess the government do want to have more control over currency if it's digital money and IRS is able to kind of, kind of, uh, manage, you know, tax payments through that better. Yeah. So, um, it is decreasing. I don't know when it's, I don't know. I never really thought about that. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't have an opinion on that. You know, it's interesting actually, uh, Linda, I, 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 I thought a, a tiny bit about that and it gets back to something that that jared just said too about technology and 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 you know you got different monopolies you don't have standard oil anymore but you got google and microsoft and and, and apple etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and and, uh, and facebook obviously um uh, you know and in digital right okay so if, if we go digital well well there you go you know you you, you got you, you got your uh your technology uh, and your money um, mixed, okay? And and what's everybody's problems with, with technology these days, the whole issue of privacy and all that? Um, could there be, might there be a backlash? I mean, there already is a backlash against the, the invasions of privacy that have uh, come out uh, because of, uh, of technology. And so I wonder, if if people there might not be a, a fairly large group of people who would very much resist uh, the disappearance of physical currency for that reason alone. That's yeah. th thinking riffing that I do in my head when I when I'm yeah. not guiding tours. Yeah, yeah. just as yeah. a follow up uh, briefly about well, you know, physical money. Boy, Linda, that is a good question. Uh, my gut, I cannot, whether there, you know, we'll have an all, an all uh, e-payments e or, uh, you know, Bitcoin or whatever, where, physical money. My, my guess is it will take a while before we're, we're free of physical money. But I can tell you practically of uh, some things that are happening. Like uh, it's, e it's, it's preferable for some, you know, say small retail outlet, like a coffee shop to demand you know, credit card payments or debit card payments, or, you know, in today's world, Google pay uh, payments, we won't take cash. Uh, you'll also see other establishments um, that will take only cash. Um, but 
this is uh it's in terms of it's it has practical issues uh, we're certainly have we at least have less physical money in our day to day and more electronic money i can tell you that in terms of my the the feeling uh, you know the on my tours right everybody all my clients i can't tell you the number of times people say i need to stop and get cash cuz you know i want to give you a tip but i don't have any physical money on me i hear that all the time uh, or I'd love you, your tour. Uh, I'd love to give you a tip. Can I PayPal it to you? I mean, this is, this is, you know, sort of uh, the times are changing, but whether we ever get to a point, Linda, where there's no physical money, boy, it's going to be a while on that. But in terms of the day-to-day -day life, yeah, yeah, less and less and less. And the concept of money is an interesting one in itself, right? So how people started with bartering and then they, they had standardized on a currency and now things are moving digital and then uh, enabled and I guess that's one thing of the financial system is to support the availability of liquidity for people that need it. And without that, the economy won't be able to function as well, right? Just imagine imagine if you really need cash and there's no digital infrastructure behind uh, behind that. And so imagine all the cash that they carry when you travel instead of able to just carry a credit card and the opportunity for theft and losing uh, your, your money. It's just uh, it's conveniences of digital money is... It's tremendous. Right. Yeah. And then this whole cryptocurrency thing. So, yeah, I don't know about that. So, uh, I mean, I don't have an opinion one way or I just haven't really thought too much um, about that. Yeah, I'm too much into tourism. <laughs> but anyways, uh, it's uh, so it's about 45 minutes into it. So uh, well, thank you, everybody, for joining. And thanks for all the questions. And uh, both uh, in this meeting and also on youtube and, and facebook uh yeah so we plan to hold these uh live events uh regularly and yeah we look for, forward to seeing you um john jared do you guys have any party remarks before we sign off i just wanted to thank everybody i hope you guys found it interesting uh can't wait where we can actually see you guys live but in the meantime uh we're going to be doing some interesting stuff here so stay tuned oh fantastic and, and only uh I would just add in closing, wonderful questions. We had some great questions today. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Well, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.